Your microphones will be kept on mute until the question period at the end of the presentation. At that time, we invite you to raise your virtual hands. James, if you could put up the slide, please, about the uh, Zoom protocols for putting up your hand. Thank you. And we'll take your questions in the order that they are received. Staff will unmute your microphone when it's your turn to ask your question. That will be Sarah handling that for us tonight. Thank you very much, Sarah. Please remember to lower your hand if someone else asks the same question you were going to. I'd like to remind everyone that we are streaming live tonight from the city of Ottawa, which is built on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We would like to honor the people and land of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, Miigwech. We would also like to honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, their elders, their ancestors, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. We encourage all those listening, wherever you might be, to do the same. Tonight's presentation is about iNaturalist, which is an online community-based tool for people who want to learn more about the plants and animals that share our world. Our speaker tonight is James Paget from the Canadian Wildlife Federation, which oversees the Canadian component of this global initiative. As a person interested in both nature and photography, I love how iNaturalist allows me to share my nature photos, identify the things I don't know, and document my sightings for others to learn from. I've even uploaded photos taken years ago in other parts of the world, just for the fun of revisiting those memories and seeing my observations all over the map. It's great. Now, we'll let James tell you all about it. Take it away, James. Great. Uh, thanks, Amy. Um, you can hear me all right. Uh, nod would be good. Awesome. Just making sure. You never know. Um, so yeah, uh, as, as Amy mentioned, I'm with Canadian Wildlife Federation, James Paget. Um, CWF, as I'm going to call it, Canadian Wildlife Federation, uh, we've been the lead in the creation of iNaturalist in Canada, so iNaturalist Canada, uh, with a lot of help from partners like the Royal Ontario Museum, Parks Canada, and NatureServe Canada. So um, we, sorry, I'm just trying to get my view set up here so I can see everything. Um, so I'm going to talk about what our naturalist is. Uh, Amy had a great intro on, on how she uses it and how uh, it can be used and connecting with nature and revisiting what you've seen in the past as well. Um, so I'm going to give a, you know, back, background on what our naturalist Canada is. Um, kind of a pretty quick run through on how to use it. I'm not going to get into too many details on that. Um, and then talk a bit more about connecting with nature through iNaturalist, as well as um, what we're seeing around Ottawa and tying into what we're seeing beyond Ottawa around Canada. Um, there may be a few people here who are uh, pretty familiar with iNaturalist already, so uh, apologies if it's a little bit redundant for those of you who, who know it well, but um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure parts of this will be uh, some repetition, but I'm hopefully good enlighten you on a few few new things that you don't know maybe. Um, so iNaturalist has really quickly become one of the world's most uh, popular nature exploration apps. Uh, it has uh, 53 million, over 53 million observations around the globe uh, and about 1.5 million people that are contributing uh, and this is globally. Um, without me getting to a whole lot of details on exactly everything, we put together a video um, to explain what iNatural says and give a real a better feel than what I could just explain to you this way. So I'm going to play this and uh, you can hear me talking about it in the video anyway. And of course, it's not working. Even though, of course, yeah. we tested it beforehand. We just tested it. Yeah, we was all smooth when we didn't have, uh, you know, fifty people, I guess, listening in with other videos going. Okay, and now my presentation's frozen as well. So that's great. Oh, there we go. So I'm not going to try that again, um, just in case. 
Uh, and um, I'll just talk about it. I think you'll get the same sense from as we talk through this anyway. So um, I encourage you, you can check this out. Here's a good plug. You can go to inaturals.ca. Um, and within the help section, actually, you can see this same video and it'll kind of give you the same sense. And there's a couple other help videos we've got in there to run you through um, some of the more specifics that we that I won't be talking about right now. Okay, so I'll skip over that real quick. So as I mentioned, there's the, the number of observations globally, but here in Canada, so we've created iNaturalist Canada, which is, um, we'll call it kind of the, the Canadian hub. So there's a few other countries across the world. There's about 13 right now and counting. There's two or three more that are coming on board in the next uh, few months that like Canada have their own versions of iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist, this is part of the global network and it's run by um, California Academy of Sciences and uh, in partnership with National Geographic, they're based out of, uh, based out of San Francisco. So we all tie into this global database, but I'm gonna talk more about the Canadian side of things. Um, so here in Canada, we have, um, this is a database created by us, by people in Canada, um, everyday people, also scientists though, parents, uh, naturalists, and youth. Uh, my kids are getting interested in, in iNaturalists as well and posting observations, um, wanting to anyway, I'm, I'm tempering that a little bit um, to keep the data quality up there. Um, but uh, basically, it's a way for people to record what they see in, uh, in nature and to share it for others to see and help identify, as Amy had mentioned at the beginning. Um, in Canada, we just hit over 4 million wildlife observations. Um, and as I mentioned, there's you know, 53 million globally, um, which is a lot more than what we have in Canada. But um, we actually are the second, most, second largest contributing country next to the United States. And uh, I'm naturalist originated in the US and it's been running for uh, several more years than it has here in Canada, so we're, um, we're doing pretty well here. So how it works, there are um, two ways to engage uh, through iNaturalist, one being uh, online uh, at iNaturalist.ca um, and the other is through the free iNaturalist app, um, which I'll talk about first. Um, before I talk about the app and, and uploading photos and how this all works, um, I just want to make mention that uh, we should be aware of to follow you know, local and provincial um, health regulations and as far as gatherings and all that go in these interesting times we're in. Um, but also be aware of you know, what's around you and land access and um, be respectful of, of people's private properties as well. Um, I'll also say that iNaturalist you know, works to take um, photos and sound uh, of, of anything, um, but we're really, targeting, it's designed to, to be um, uploading um, things that are wild, so not captive or cultivated, not like our garden plants, so to speak. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as, after as well. Um, so the app, it, it's pretty simple. Um, if you download the app, uh, either in the app store or through iNaturalist.ca, if you go on your uh, smartphone through there, there's a link to download. Um, and you can create an account or log into an existing account. Um, the app works offline, um, but you'll have to download the app and, and sign in online. Um, and how it works offline is you, you record your observations and it stores them on your phone. And then when you get back to a uh, Wi-Fi connection, you can upload the data there. Or if you've got a good data plan on your phone, you can always just upload instantly as well. Um, pretty straightforward, once you open the app, there's a green plus. That's how you add an observation. Um, click that, take your photo, and then, um, uh, it'll bring you to the, like, to the screen that you're seeing here on the, on the image. This screen here is where it'll, it'll fetch the location and date um, from your smartphone. Um, if you don't see the location showing up, you just check the location services in your settings of your phone, not the app itself, and the phone, um, and make sure that it, it is giving access to iNaturalist to, um, to record, to pull that observer, that location off. Um, there you just tap on the species um, field and you can enter what you saw. Um, if you don't even know what it is, that's fine. You can either leave a blank or write something gen general like tree. Um, but also if you have data right now, um, here's where there's an image recognition software that will actually help you identify uh, what it is you're just taking a, taking a photo of. Um, and so this, this does need data. So if you don't have a data, data plan, um, what I which is what I do is I save the observation and then when I go back to um, a Wi-Fi connection then I'll, I'll open it up again and use the 
uh, auto ID feature there while I have a Wi-Fi connection. Now, you know, some things don't lend themselves well to uh, to a smartphone camera, or we just don't want to be um, interacting with an app while we're out in nature, which I, I totally get, and, and I also want to be appreciating nature and not my phone all the time. Um, so one thing we can do is just skip the app altogether and just take a photo of what you're, uh, what you're wanting to record, and then you can upload it after either through the app or just or online at inatros.ca. And uh, that's what I'll talk about now. Again, pretty straightforward, iNaturals.ca. There's the login button at the top. Um, so here's where you sign into an existing account or create a new one. As soon as you log in, it takes you to what's called the dashboard. Um, and this is um, where you have your, uh, kind of everything that you've uploaded into iNaturalist, conversations that have happened, people that have helped identify things that, you, um, that you've observed um, and kind of, this is your hub, essentially, of, of how you interact with iNaturalist at that point. From your dashboard, um, you can click uh, two spots to upload observations. Um, there's the Add Observations, which is pretty obvious. Um, but there's also the green Upload button in the, along the top bar. And this top bar shows up anywhere on iNaturalist.ca, so you can click that at any point to upload uh, uh, observations or a photo or sound that you've, that you've recorded already. That brings you to a page looking like this. And once you bring your photos in, they uh, appear as what we call species cards. Um, on this card is where you enter the information on, of what you saw. Um, now remember, as I mentioned, if you have um, your location services enabled on your smartphone, um, you'll be able to, uh, there the, the system will actually pull in that location already from, uh, from the photo properties. So you won't have to enter that again. If it's not there, you can either enter it yourself um, and as well as, as write the data in. Um, but the data, again, should also be pulled in automatically. Um, some digital cameras also have built-in GPSs, uh, so it would also pull it in. Um, or and some can you can sync up to your uh, camera and it'll get the GPS location off of your from your sorry from your cell phone and it'll get your GPS location from your cell phone and it'll pull this in as well. Um, if it doesn't have those, you just kind of have to remember where you were. Um, and within a range, you can actually put an accuracy level of how close you think you were to actually where, where your observation was taken. Um, and from here, again, when you click on the species name, um, our image recognition software works. It's the same software as in the app as well as um, online. Um, and I should say, this is, this is really good. So if you haven't tried this out, you, you really should give it a try. Um, there's been some stats that have, have run on this the, from like, the developers of iNaturalist that have found um, that 70, about 75% of the time, um, the species is actually the first one that this, this list suggests. Um, and 85% of the time, it's one of these species in the top 10 that they, they, they suggest it might be. Um, so this is usually a combination of like image recognition software, but also your location to find out what species might be around. And if it's something that only exists far, far down in the United States, far south or somewhere else on the globe, um, it won't recommend that as a potential match for your species. Um, once you get everything added into there, you click the submit button and um, it goes into your own personal account, like I mentioned where your dashboard is, so you'll see it in there, but also um, for other people to um, see and help identify. Um, and this is where the engaging engagement part can come into as well. So. Uh, we can engage with the community. There's uh, about 100,000 people in Canada that have posted observations to iNaturalist already. Um, and there's um, you know, 1.5 million around the globe. Um, and uh, people around the globe can also see the observations that we're making as well. So um, a snake expert, for example, that's, um, I don't know, down in Southern Texas might see this and help weigh in on something that we found here in Canada. Um, so as an example, the auto identification, as I mentioned, is on the left side we're seeing, and it suggested the top one here, it suggested was the gray rat snake. Um, and the community had gone through this and confirmed that that's actually what it was. Um, if, I don't know if you can actually see, yeah, you can probably see the actual text in there, but basically, um, you know, someone's suggesting it, another person's like, ah, this looks like a milk snake, which it, it quite does. Um, and and the the, the strength in this is the the experts or people who know who know like specifically you know snakes or whatever uh, species they're um, commenting on 
can explain why they think it's this way. And if in one of these, it explains like, oh, it's a, it's a rat snake versus a milk snake because of you know, these features that you should look at. So not only is it helping identify, it's helping teach these people um, or teach us as users, because I don't know a lot of species as well, um, that, you know, how to help identify for the next time. And this is exactly what happened with uh, an observation here that happened uh, this summer in Quebec. Uh, a financialist user who is, uh, a, quite, knows their birds quite well um, walked by this elm leaf and thought, well, this is an interesting kind of cut pattern in the leaf. It's distinctive. Had no idea what it was. Took a photo and put it on a naturalist. They had no idea. This caught the attention of uh, an entomologist who was browsing on naturalist observations. Um, they then sent it to an expert in Germany and another one in the United States and confirmed that it's uh, the elm zigzag sawfly, which um, doesn't sound all that exciting, but it's actually it's the first occurrence of this uh, invasive species in North America um, that a person in Quebec happened to be walking by an elm tree uh, and found this. This uh, then spurred some other people in the region to say, oh, this is really cool. We're going to keep an eye out for it as well. And they found a few more spots um, showing up of the same um, of the same species in in this area. So um, through one observation, where a few other people have started looking, this then caught the attention of uh, CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, and they track uh, invasive plant pests. They were interested and sent somebody out to the site itself and partnering with um, Canadian Forest Services and they they did a survey and actually collected larvae and confirmed they have now a specimen um, and just very super thankful and actually I've, I've been working with uh, CFIA now um, to help flag these observations to them so we can get a handle on um, some of these early detection it's called for, for invasive species because it's much easier to address a species before it comes fully established and to make sure it doesn't spread than it is to try and deal with it after the fact. So this is one uh, real strength that uh, shows how the, the data and this information can be used even when the person had no idea what they were uh, taking a picture of. Something similar happened back in 2018, uh, the European firebug. Um, this was known in North America before, but it hadn't been ever recorded in Canada. Similar kind of conversation back and forth confirm the species and yes it's the first it was the first occurrence in in Canada this was in southern Ontario and uh, a few more have been found since um, similarly this one's non-invasive but uh, a crayfish um, that uh, wasn't known to be in Canada before was found uh, as a result of somebody um, taking photos of uh, uploading photos into our naturals um, so that's connecting with the community. Um, now, how do we, you know how are we using this to connect with nature? And I'm not an advocate for um, burying our face in a cell phone. I much prefer to appreciate nature itself. So, you know, how does that fit in together? Um, well, you know, especially now with, um, especially earlier on with isolation and people were were confining a little bit more, um, we've been having potentially an opportunity to to kind of notice what's outside our windows. Um, and around our, our homes. So um, we can look for nature around or, and within our home. Um, now this photo isn't really all that useful uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that for iNaturalist. Um, it's much better to try and get something with a zoom to get a photo of, of a bird actually visiting the feeder as opposed to something uh, zoomed way out. Um, and this is where a digital camera comes in much more handily. Um, we can. These are these are butterflies that have visited my window from uh, that I've taken photos of from inside my house, um, and probably a lot of people don't want to know how many uh, crawling things live inside our homes. But uh, you may be curious to find out what uh, what's around. And I'm sure this would be a great uh, great activity with the kids, a little scavenger hunt to go down into your basement and see what you can find. Um, you can venture outside, and you know things are. Um, cooling off so there's a few less uh, species flying around um, but you can check uh, around on your garden plants uh, or your balcony plants or in your gardens um, there's still gonna be a you know, number of um, species coming around and with our feeders as well um, and then if you're as it's safe to do uh, as we leave our homes a little bit further uh, abroad on these nice quiet family walks you can uh, keep an eye out and um, instead of, of uh, you know, being completely into the your cell phone, you can always just, like I was mentioning, take a photo and upload it later to iNaturalist. 
Um, so you, what, you know, to look for when we're out on walks, and this is a great thing with kids to do as well, is to look under logs or rocks. Um, one thing I'll mention with this though is always make sure you do it carefully because you don't want to hurt whatever it is you're flipping the rock over to look for. Um, and always put it gently back um, because we don't want to leave habitat removed. We want to keep that as a spot for, for wildlife to be in. Um, and something that's going to be a lot more relevant in the next weeks and months um, you can also upload tracks to iNaturalist. Um, image recognition software is not great on tracks, um, and that's just because there aren't a lot of photos to tr basically they train the software um, uh, on photos that are uh, in iNaturalist, so that we just don't have as much um, as many images of tracks. So the more we can get in there, the better it's going to get. Um, but it does work, and experts can identify uh, tracks quite well. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is uh, you can upload sound files as well to iNaturalist. So um, bird calls, um, and in the spring and summer, you can upload frog calls. There's no image, there's no recognition so software yet for calls, um, but uh, again, people who, who know these calls can listen into that and help identify what it is uh, that you recorded. Um, so as I mentioned before, when we're thinking about recording things, um, this image of a tree isn't great, especially when you say, I swear there's a bird in there. Um, much better to get, use a zoom, something with a, a, a bit of a zoom to get a close up photo. So in general, closer is better as much as we can. Um, granted, keep a, a safe distance from wildlife. Um, similarly, uh, you know, this, the, the distance photo from a, a shrub, uh, doesn't help so think about the key features what we want to get a, what's going to help us identify this this plant so um, fruits or seeds uh, leaves when we're thinking about birds you know getting the color patterns um, are any stripes on uh, frogs or other uh, amphibians just any any little thing that might set it apart from other other species um, I should also mention, I was mentioning tracks. Um, you can actually also upload, because iNaturalist is for like, evidence of what you've seen, evidence of wildlife as well is, is included. So um, even scat, so animal poo does work and some people can identify uh, from a photo um, uh, wildlife uh, feces. And uh, we actually had a bear in our backyard a couple of weeks ago, which I didn't know about until coming across the, the droppings and uploaded that to iNaturalist. So that counts as a, as an observation, there was definitely a bear through here. So uh, that does work. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, what we're seeing around in wildlife. And I'm, I'm not downtown, but I'm in Elmer and Gatineau. So there's, it's, there's pretty, uh, pretty urban area. So I'm gonna talk about what we're seeing around as far as wildlife goes in, in, in our cities and urban areas. Um, and we can, as and Amy actually mentioned this quite well, like you can go back through and think about where you've been in the country and, and reminisce on some family vacations or hikes by going through old photos. Um, as long as you can remember where you saw, uh, where you took these um, so that you can upload them to a spot on a map. Um, your old photos probably don't look like this. <laughs> They're probably more a lot like mine in this long list of, um, list of files and a folder that you haven't opened in a while. Um, but if you're at home this winter with some, some time to spare, uh, it might be an opportune time to open these up and reminisce and, uh, and upload them to iNaturalist and, and help uh, with conservation at the same time. Uh, the other thing, if uh, you're looking for something to do, is to help, uh, as I talked about, the community engagement. You can help others identify their, their observations. I mean, even if you're not an expert in uh, birds, if you know, you know, a handful of backyard birds uh, that would come to a feeder, you can just browse and identify every single chickadee that you uh, come across on a naturalist or, or help get it to a spot where it can be identified. If it's, um, you know, it's in a certain species group, you can identif help identify just to that and then experts can, can take it from there. So that's a way to engage as well with nature, even though we're, um, and, and then helps us learn what's, what's around, what other people have, have found. Um, so it's kind of more of a self-guided uh, way to use iNaturalist and, and um, get outside with it. There's also more of a focused way we can think about. And, um, you know, pandemic-related restrictions have, have propelled, you know, in innovative ways in which we do things. And, you know, this video um, presentation is exactly a, a good example of that. 
Um, and iNaturals has some functionality uh, that people are now really kind of realizing is, is super useful in this kind of way. And I think this is going to go um, stay with us um, into the future as people kind of figure some of these things out. Um, so creative, creatively using projects is, is one of those. Um, so projects within iNaturals are a way for an organization or, or an individual to kind of create a, uh, a project that will pull in um, like focused either in a certain area or a certain species group on uh, to pull to kind of add observations to. And I think this will be a little more clear as I talk about it uh, in the next slides. Um, so like in the past, CWF and, and others have hosted you know, bio blitzes or other gatherings uh, for people to meet and learn uh, about nature. And a bio blitz is to search and try and inventory everything that we found in a, in a given area. Um, well, that hasn't been possible this year. Um, and um, this kind of spurred our, our thinking around how do we get people to feel connected and still outside, but yet not gathering. Um, so at the onset of confinement, um, we launched what we called uh, um, observations from isolation. So the, this idea, and it kind of also spurred from, as I've been working from home, sitting in front of my window, seeing you know, maybe more or just noticing uh, different species, you know, birds flying around um, and wondering, you know, are other people noticing wildlife coming to their house as well? So we created this observation from isolation project to try and capture that. Uh, we've since morphed that into what we're calling now observation nation, uh, more as a way to kind of connect um, all of us across the country and give us a sense of, of accomplishment and unity into what we can, what we can uh, uh, contribute and, and find as far as species go. So, uh, if you're so inclined, you can find projects if you go on iNaturals.ca or within the app, um, and you can search for them. So if you're interested in joining, you can search for Observation Nation. Um, but you can find a whole bunch of other projects. I'm going to talk about a couple others that might, might be of interest for the Ottawa area as well. Um, as we talk about BioBlitzes, so CWF did run some uh, in the past, and, and we partnered on this one actually with Wintergreen Studios. They're in uh, the Frontenac Axis area of Ontario. Um, and they originally were planning a, a in-person bio blitz and obviously couldn't do that this, this past summer. So they converted this into, they call it like a choose your own adventure style bio blitz. So um, it was two days of um, Zoom presentations uh, focused on like certain species uh, and, and learning about either certain areas or species or um, um, aspects to conservation. And then there were also, um, uh, pre-recorded videos that people could watch at any time, as well as some activities that could take place uh, kind of guided through Zoom or um, just some ideas that people could download and, and do on their own time. Um, but the BioBlitz aspect, which is tallying observations, instead of being on a focused property, um, it was set so that anybody who joined this project, wherever they were in the country, could contribute. Um, and so uh, if you're in Vancouver or Halifax or anywhere in between, um, then you could uh, you could join and, and go wherever it's it's safe and you're comfortable to record observations and it all goes into this kind of um, single tally um, so that's one way that the projects can can help uh, unify people and, and contribute to something um, and um, we're kind of doing something like this and there's this is going to be uh, relevant to Ottawa as well so in the spring um, which seems like a far way off but we're already thinking about this um, there's this global uh, initiative called the City Nature Challenge. Um, so it's a global initiative. We also have this Canadian initiative within it called City Nature Challenge Canada, where um, cities that are participating, it's this friendly competition across the globe to see uh, which cities can engage the most people, can record the most observations and the most species in their area. Um, Canada, we're, about, we're a little bit... Uh, latitudinally challenged, uh, shall we say. So our winters uh, and the spring especially isn't a great time for a number of species. So that's why we've created this Canadian one specifically. So we're, we're kind of a bit more on a level playing field as far as what's going to be out and about in the spring. Um, so uh, it's basically participating cities across Canada and, and the globe. Um, basically, all, you have, all people have to do to to participate is if you're in one of those cities, use iNaturalist, upload an observation, and it automatically gets added into this project. And then, um, then we have this overarching project that's going to compare cities. Uh, and right now, there's, I don't know, all of them off the top of my head, but there's Toronto, there's uh, Halifax, Calgary, Edmonton, 
a couple of municipalities in Vancouver. Um, we're looking at potentially uh, Yellowknife up north, which are going to have a real challenge. Um, so anyway, it's a way for us to all kind of connect at the same time in the spring, right when everybody's probably itching to get outside in some nice weather anyway. So keep an eye out for that uh, come uh, next April. Um, and also around Ottawa, and this um, aren't ones that CWF is involved in necessarily, but they're, I think there might be interesting projects for folks around. Um, there's the Ontario Butterfly Atlas. If people want to join, and it's tallying all the butterflies um, that could be then used for mapping and, uh, and butterfly distributions in Ontario. Uh, if you're visiting any Ontario parks, they've got a project that's good, that automatically adds any observation you record within the park that, um, that they can then use for um, their knowledge of what's in the park, but also for how they, how they carry out their conservation work. Um, similarly, uh, the Herps of Ontario um, are adding all uh, reptiles and amphibians that, um, uh, that, are, that are recorded in, in Ontario. Um, so CWF, one of our projects, um, and this is going to tie into what, what's happening with wildlife a little bit, um, is uh, Help the Turtles. And this is a project that's, that's automatically pulling in all the turtle observations across the country. Um, but on top of that, we are uh, we have been in the Ottawa area carrying out our own um, targeted surveys by our um, our summer staff and our biologists here at CWF to look for turtles on roads and, and other areas. But this is uh, this is showing the turtles that we've found, and this isn't nine naturals data. But what we're looking to do, um, well, we use nine naturals to record our observations for the project. So all of our own observations we're using nine naturals, and then we can download them out of that afterwards, um, and we've mapped them here. But we're also looking to use the observations that other people have submitted to iNaturalist and use some other GIS and mapping software to find out which ones of those are also on roads to add to our own um, inventory work. Um, and this is, this is basically showing, so these are all tools that have been found on road. We have found in the last three uh, years uh, about 1,850 turtles on roads in, in this area, so it's greater than just Ottawa. Um, and pretty much all of them have been dead on road. Um, only about 200 of these 1,800 uh, were alive, which we safely moved across the road. Um, so what we're doing with this information and, and hoping to pull the iNaturalist uh, data from people that submit observations of turtles um, is to find these what we're calling hotspots, so areas that are um, more densely concentrated of where turtles, turtles are being hit on roads to then work with um, municipalities and the jurisdictions to um, mitigate this, so to, to install fencing to keep turtles from getting hit on roads, which is really quite an effective way to do that. Um, fencing is pretty effective, and especially when it's with a, within an, an area of a culvert where the turtles can pass underneath, um, it, it really reduces the road mortality. Um, this is relevant as well. It should mention that um, seven out of the eight species of turtle in Ontario are at risk species some more than others. Um, so, uh, and row mortality is one of the biggest, biggest threats to these, to these individuals. So um, we're really working to target um, improving this uh, status for some of these uh, species at risk. So we'll, what we thought, what I thought was gonna happen with uh, this year with people being uh, home more, um, not traveling to work, likely reduced traffic that we would maybe see uh, bit of a relief for turtles this, uh, this uh, early summer when they were on the move. Um, so turtles are, are more active in June, end of May in, into June, um, as they're mating and finding nesting sites. And this is where I'm most often hit on roads. So I figured we would have less with people traveling less. And we actually found that there wasn't uh, a notable decrease. We had just as many turtles this year as we have any other year. Um, so this made me wonder, and I thought this isn't quite what I expected would happen. So uh, I've looked into some of the information around uh, that we could find from other species on iNaturalist. So, um, so here's the here's this, the the distribution or the the points. All of these are a single observation on iNaturalist in the Ottawa area. 
and apologies for those in Gadno. Uh, I didn't, I had to cut the boundary a little bit, and I, so it doesn't all uh, include all the observations in Gadsno. Um, so, uh, so I was wondering, is this, you know, this phenomenon we're thinking, we've heard lots of reports about um, increase in wildlife and people are seeing uh, more um, the presence in our cities and uh, so it begs the question, you know, are, are there actually, is there more wildlife around or is it just that we're around in our homes and uh, have the time or taking the time to notice what's coming by? Uh, and I suspect it's a bit of both um, and that's kind of what, what it's seeming to be. Um, so looking at just the iNaturalist data, uh, so those observations, this is, these are uh, stat, stats around specific to the Ottawa area, but this is pretty much the same trend across the country when I'm looking at the, the global or the nation numbers. Um, so we're seeing about double the number of observations uh, in iNaturalist this year as compared to last year, but it's also double last year as compared to the year before. Um, also, we've had not quite double, but a pretty big uptick in number of people observing iNaturalist. So basically just more people are using the platform and reporting things, so obviously there should be more observations. And we're seeing a similar trend, although there's markedly a bigger jump uh, from 2018 to 2019. Um, so then I was looking at, well, what, how much has changed between 20, like this year compared to 2019 and then 2019 compared to the year before. Um, so looking at the kind of the relative or the rate of increase from, from year to year, and it, it looks like there was a bigger jump generally in the rate, some uh, percent of increase uh, from 2018 to 19 than we have to now. Um, and that's a bit more mark or a bit more noticed in the number of uh, observers. So that's the, the kind of pale orange color. Um, so uh, there's not a whole lot to, to back uh, having a whole bunch, a uh, lot more observation or a lot more, more wildlife present in Ottawa. It seems like more, there's just, well, according to iNaturalist anyway, um, there's more people observing as well. But I thought, well, what about species groups? So are people seeing more of things that might pass by our house than we would other things? Um, and so we're seeing, so this is the, this is not rate, but this is the increase of observations, not the number. So it's like uh, from this year compared to last year um, in orange and last year compared to the year before in the blue. Um, so again, as I mentioned, we've had more people on our naturalist, we should see more observations, uh, a bigger jump. Um, and we're seeing the biggest one in plants and insects, but relatively, um, we're seeing uh, almost doubling of an increase in bird reports as well as mammals, although in, in all there's less because there's just less mammals around and people are seeing plants and insects. Um, but the increase is almost double for, for birds and, and mammals from the year before. Um, and interestingly, amphibians and reptiles are, they're still more altogether on naturalists, but the, the, the increase from the previous year is actually not quite as noticeable this year as it was to last. So then I was wondering, well, okay, is it maybe that um, the species that are more venturing into town are the ones that people are seeing more? So mammals are more mobile, they'd be maybe passing by our houses, birds as well. Um, but maybe amphibians and reptiles, not everybody has the habitat for amphibians and reptiles in their backyard, um, often their wetlands. So maybe people aren't venturing out to these uh, wetlands to go record um, amphibians and reptiles. So I looked at kind of the spread of observations and I didn't run any like um, mapping stats to see if there's a specific patterning. Um, this is more just visually, but um, this is 2019 and the number of observations across the Ottawa Gatineau area. And I thought, well, with 2020 and people maybe not venturing as far, maybe we'd see more clustering of observations. So to na specific neighborhoods as opposed to this widespread and maybe less in some of the more remote areas or some of the, the more publicly accessible areas like Gatineau yeah, no Park, maybe people aren't traveling up into the park quite as much, or the Greenbelt area, maybe not quite so much. Um, but in 2020, it doesn't really seem to be. Um, we've got just obviously more observations in, in total, um, but it's, it's still a pretty similar spread. So here's what people are seeing in Ottawa. Um, 
well, the most things people are seeing. So this is at the top, I think 35 um, species that have been reported. Um, so these are a number of observations. Um, and so I was gonna look into specifically some species groups to see if there's anything that kind of jumps out. So I was looking at, you know, things that might be trending. So I thought, um, you know, if, the, if, if there is an increase in wildlife, it's probably more the generalist species. So the ones that will do well. So I shouldn't say increase in wildlife, increase in visible wildlife. So people reporting more. Um, uh, I figure it's probably because uh, they'd be ones that are well adapted to the human environment, right? The ones that can come and get into our garbages and head to our feeders. Um, so I thought, uh, you know, what about our backyard birds? Um, and remember in general, there's about twice as many observations this year as last year. So we, that's kind of the average. So we'd kind of expect that that would be the same. So we'd expect twice as many um, birds uh, this year as last year. And, and in general, that's what we found for um, feeder birds. Uh, except cardinals, we there are actually three times more uh, observations of cardinals this year as compared to last year. Um, and then thinking of some of, the, some of these generalist um, mammals, so raccoons, skunks, um, again, pretty similar to background rates, what we expect, skunks and raccoons, about twice as many, but red foxes, people have reported three times as many red foxes this year as last year. So. Again, is it because people are home and they're noticing, you know, foxes are pretty, pretty uh, cryptic uh, or shy. Um, so maybe people are just around to notice them more than, than they would have in the past. Um, noticeably though, uh, butterflies, there have been less, there's been a bit of an increase in generally in butterflies as compared to last year, which we would expect a doubling almost, but um, it wasn't a double. And actually monarchs, there's less monarchs reported this year in Ionatulus than there were altogether last year. Um, and when I say last year, I was measuring from like the beginning of the year up till basically November as well last year. So I didn't include the, so I had the same kind of time periods for both years. Um, and I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention coyotes when we're talking about city of Ottawa stuff. Um, but uh, we've had, there are about twice as many coyotes reported this year as compared to last year in Ottawa, um, 41 in total. Um, so again, as I was saying, it's, it's what we would kind of expect with increase of observers. We'd have about double um, as compared to most other uh, species. And in fact, I actually was curious, I was looking at the, the Blanding's turtle, which is a, a threatened species and you know, not very common for people to observe. And there's more observations of the Blanding's turtle in the Ottawa area than there are of, of coyotes. Um, and then black bears, I was, I was intrigued by black bears the other week, um, and there's actually fewer black bears that have been seen so far this year. I mean, the total is still only uh, 11 were seen, or I shouldn't say seen, 11 were reported to a naturalist last year uh, through observations, and there's been about five this year. So, um, so that's kind of a snapshot of some specific species. What I would encourage people to do if you're so interested is all this information that I've been pulling out is, is available for anybody to, to look at and, and go through uh, on a naturalist. Um, the way I was doing this is if you go to iNaturalist.ca, and you actually don't have to have an account to do this, if anywhere on the site, if you go to the Explore, um, so this is, this is in, uh, within iNaturalist.ca, if you go to the Explore tab, um, it brings you to a map like this. And if you click on filters, uh, there's options to search by year, by area, um, even before filters, you can search by location, you can write in Ottawa or anywhere else. Uh, you're curious about in Canada and you can search by specific species within the filters You can search by species group. This is where you could search for just birds or just reptiles um, and a few other um, uh, uh, Search features you can search by person as well um, Once you have your filters in and as you zoom in you'll see like this the, the dots the actual observations start to pop up and as you zoom in a little bit more, you can see uh, and click on any one of those dots and it'll give you like a snapshot of what that observation is. You can click through that observation to take you to the observation page of that species. And it'll give you a bit more information on who saw it, where it was, who else has identified or confirmed the identification of it. Um, so I would encourage if anybody is interested to go through some Ottawa observations or anywhere um, and find some of these notable trends that I hadn't hadn't uh, uncovered, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. So if you ever wanted to get in touch, um, 
that'd be great to to hear if anybody else is finding some some interesting trends in Ottawa or anywhere else. Um, the other thing that uh, as you go through the species page uh, or the observation page, you can click to learn more about a, a given species. So if you click on the name at the top, it'll take you through to what's called a species page, uh, taxon page, um, and it'll give you information about the species. And this isn't about the observation itself. It's about you can get a range map. You can click on the about tab to learn a bit more about it. And one thing I find is really interesting is it'll show you the um, what's called the seasonality that you see in this little graph is when people are observing it most throughout the year. So uh, northern flickers seem to be more reported in kind of end of March into April, and again another little peak in October. So that's interesting if you're you know if you're interested in finding a species, this is the kind of the times that are they're more often reported. You can also search um, within the top part uh, for other species. You can also find this by clicking on the uh, More tab and Taxa Info, and it takes you to a page like this, where um, you can either search by species in there or browse species group, and it'll give you, um, you can click through to more information on any one, any one of those species. So, um, kind of brings me to the, the, the closing thinking on this, is, you know, are we seeing a rewilding of Ottawa? Um, and Sadly, I think not. Um, you know, I think it's it's possible with uh, reduced human presence that you know wildlife that are normally wary of people might feel a little more secure to show up, and um, that might be changing a little bit as as people are moving around again a little bit. And actually, these wildlife that, especially earlier on, kind of uh, early last like this past spring, where people were really confining a little bit more, um, now these wildlife may be kind of caught thinking like they're they were in the clear a little bit less people around and, and now we're kind of being surprised again by people showing up again. Um, so I think it's more likely that species are that are kind of already around are just more visible. Um, and you know we could see some small and small scale and short term benefits um, like I thought might happen with turtles, uh, but we didn't see this with our turtle project, but the, the, I mean there's definitely a decreased human presence. So um, it kind of gives give, gives wildlife a little bit of a breathing room for for a little bit of time. Um, but honestly, I think this you know, the biggest opportunity in all this. It might be for us to take a pause and catch a glimpse of you know what a lessened human impact might do for the natural world, uh, and kind of rethink our relationship with with the natural world and and, and going forward. So with that, I just like to acknowledge the partners in creation and managing of iNaturalist uh, Canada and uh, turn it over to any questions or thoughts people might have. So just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function. Thank you. Either I've covered everything really well, or nobody understood, or people don't want to uh, jump on on their their camera. <laughs> you can keep your camera off if you want. If you don't want to uh, have yourself on video. So we do have a question. Uh, so the first question is going to come from Lynn Nguyen. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm a writer for the Fulcrum, the student newspaper at U Ottawa, and I was researching uh, urban ecology for an article and I came across iNaturalist and I'm so glad that I came across it yesterday so that I could come to this presentation today. And my first question is more a logistics question. When is the recording for this video going to be uploaded? Um, I'm wondering because uh, I'm writing a piece about it and it would be um, nice to have the recording as a reference. I'll leave that for 
City of Ottawa folks, I think they'll be putting it up, right? Uh, that is certainly the intention. I don't have a firm timeline on that, I'm afraid, at this point. Um, Sarah, maybe we can talk later about uh, ways to make it available, if possible, um, in the interim, if it's going to take us a little while to get it up on YouTube. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, the next question is going to come from Jose. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, just wondering about uh, the, the uh, photos that get uploaded. Is there, uh, what's the feeling about uh, pictures of, let's say, dead birds? Um, uploading a bunch of those. I come across a number as a, since I patrol for safe wings uh, with the bird collisions. Uh, are you not interested in those or uh, would you be interested in those? Yeah. Yeah, great. I'm glad you asked. Um, yes, definitely interested in dead things. Unfortunately, there are a lot. Um, as I mentioned with our turtle project, a lot of those were um, observations and, and photos of roadkill turtles. Um, and so, yeah, the uh, collisions with uh, windows, and I think um, Safe Wings Ottawa might actually have a project with an iNaturalist or either them or Flap Canada to specifically record and track uh, collisions with buildings. So, yes, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll just add a, a point there further to what James just said. Uh, mortality data, while often depressing, is um, extremely valuable, as, as James pointed out, for, you know, identifying areas where we do have high mortality, whether it's from roads or from buildings. Um, it's useful information to know. And if it, it does help us to form a better idea of where there are problems and you know there may actually be things we can do to, to make it better so without that data uh, there's no real evidence to support the need to make change happen so it, it's definitely valuable to know where these things are happening thank you the next question is going to come from ellie Hi. Hi, um, I had a question and was just wondering, James, uh, after your awesome presentation, if you could clarify um, some of the location information. I was trying at one point to upload images and um, I can't remember what the word is, conceal or like obscure. Word. I wanted to obscure my location because I, I teach at a college and I just wanted to take a bunch of pictures in my backyard and I didn't want everyone to know where I was <laughs> and so um, but I had to in the app I had to obscure it like multiple times it felt like it kept trying to geolocate and and it just felt like there was a lot of steps to actually obscuring so I guess that's one piece of my question and then the other piece is which um, groups of species are automatically obscured in terms of species at risk and, and sightings in that sort of more um, sensitive type of, of observational data? Yeah, good, good question. I didn't get into that. Um, so yes, you, everybody can obscure their own observation. Uh, and uh, basically what it does is it creates the, a, a box around your observation and then puts that point randomly within that box somewhere. So someone can't just be like, oh, it was in the middle um, of that box. Um, and that does, that does it by about a roughly 20 kilometers by 15 kilometers kind of thing. Um, for your location that the app is getting, it's still probably still trying to find an actual location. But when you click obscure within the app, there's an option and it's called uh, geo privacy um, within the app or when you upload on to iNaturalist.ca. Um, you can still see your coordinate, but other people won't. Um, and you'll see this when you go to an observation. Uh, if you go right through, like I showed with the Northern Flicker, when you go to the, the observation page itself, um, if, it's a, if it's obscured, there'll be the box, and there's, a, there's a, an info and information button, and it'll say, why is this observation obscured? And it'll say either um, the observer has obscured it themselves, or it's because the species is um, sensitive, and that's the next part where um, species get obscured. So, um, so that's the one is anybody can obscure their own observation and other people won't see it. But there are species that are sensitive to 
uh, we're calling them sensitive to persecution and harm. Um, so things that are collected for pet trade or uh, collected for resale, um, certain plants like that, uh, turtles, um, and certain species that are that are unfortunately persecuted, uh, those are automatically hidden uh, in a, in iNaturalist. And the way it does it, we're actually updating that hopefully in the next couple of months, um, which we're working with um, provincial uh, authorities, provincial experts um, that are in what are called the conservation data centers. They manage rare species occurrences, um, and we're working to develop a list of specific species that really need to be hidden. The way it is right now, a lot of all endangered and threatened species are, and this is based on the uh, IUCN it is, so it's the International um, Conservation, the Union on um, IUCN, Inter International Union on Conservation. Um, uh, they, they have a list, a red list of species that are, um, that are threatened throughout the world, and all of those species in Canada are also obscured, uh, which has led to a lot of species being hidden, this randomly, this obscuring, um, not randomly, but they're randomly obscured, um, um, that aren't really necessary. They don't, we don't need to hide them in Canada, but in some places, maybe elsewhere in the world, they do. Um, so we're working to kind of refine that list. Thank you. The next question comes from Pauline. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I would like to uh, also add to uh, the first lady that um, asked a question was regarding uh, the presentation. Um, I unfortunately, my, there was myself and um, another person who couldn't get in uh, the Zoom session. So we missed probably at least half of the presentation. I'm, just wondering if um, perhaps you can let um, our uh, group leaders know um, when the uh, presentation will be uploaded to YouTube. I'm going to suggest that anyone who's interested in the recording, uh, we will be trying to get it up on YouTube as soon as we can. But if you're, if you're particularly interested in it, maybe just email us at the, um, the wildlife mailbox. The information and the link for that is on the city's wildlife speaker series page on the web. And if you just send us an email uh, and let us know of your interest, we'll respond back and let you know when it is posted. And um, if, it's, if we find out that it is going to take a while for some strange technical reason, then uh, we may explore other ways of getting it to you. Although I'm told the file will be quite large. So, you know, it's not something that we're going to be able to email. Um, but at least we'll, uh, we'll be able to communicate with you if, if you have a particular interest in knowing when it's available. So just send us an email. Thank you. Uh, I could also add to, uh, I gave a similar presentation to this one at the beginning of the summer. So uh, I guess kind of it was more late spring. Um, so if anybody's interested in that one is up on uh, CWF's website, uh, it'll kind of talk about the ins and outs of iNaturalist and, and it, I do get into a little bit more about the, the specifically uploading observations and talk a bit more about that in that one. Um, so if you Google CWF uh, webinars or Canadian Wildlife Federation webinars, you, you can find that one as well. Thank you. The next question comes from Iola. Did that work? That works. Hi, Iola. Hi, hi, Amy. Hi, James. Um, hi. Is there a way to upload old slides? Uh, hearing what Amy said about uh, revisiting past um, past locations, uh, we've got boxes. I've got boxes of slides. Um, some some of which have pictures of birds that I took in Africa. Some in Europe. Some in New Zealand. Um, I wouldn't mind uploading them. I'm not sure I can get good uh, location data for them at this point, but I would upload them if it's possible to go from a 35 millimeter slide. Uh, uh, I think your best bet might to take a, if, if it works, take a photo of your slide. Um, 
because otherwise, yeah, I don't, there's not really, it has to be digitized somehow. It's got to be digital uh, to get onto iNaturalist. Um, you can upload observations without photos. Um, that's doable. It just makes it, uh, well, impossible for other people to confirm what it is that you saw or what you're, what you're reporting. So that data is a little harder to, to be able to be as used for conservation, but you still can. There's probably services out there to um, convert old formats into digital images. Um, Cause I'm sure there's lots of folks with the old slide collections and old hard copy photos yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, old hard copy photos, at least you could scan them if you had access to a scanner. I'm not sure how that would work with a slide. Thank you. The next question comes from Aisha. Hi there. Um, that presentation was awesome. And I was particularly interested in sort of seeing how the results were used. Um, so I'm interested in a naturalist, both from a, an observer perspective, um, but also I work for an agency that would be interested in, in using some of this data. Um, so one question that I had was photos that get uploaded from other people. Um, are there sort of permissions that are, you know, by uploading a photo, do you automatically grant permission for people to use those photos? Or are they still sort of like considered um, property of the, the person who took them? Just, yeah, that's I'm a good question. About using them for, you know, say presentations or something like that. Yeah, um, so by default, so everybody who creates an account has their, your account settings, like any um, Facebook or uh, email service or whatever. Um, so uh, within the account settings, uh, you can change the privacy and the ownership of certain things. So um, by default, all photos, like all profiles or accounts are set to be what's called the Creative Commons license, which allows the use of the photo uh, provided that it's properly um, cited. So you have to give credit to the photographer or the owner of the photo. And actually, if you go to an observation, you'll see at the bottom of the observation itself, a little C or CC. Um, you can click on that and it'll tell you what the license is on that. And it'll, you can click through to a link uh, to a site that explains what that license means and how you can reference it. Um, so the default is Creative Commons, meaning others can use it, not for non-commercial use. Um, some people do change their profile to be uh, copyrighted photos. Um, and then so instead of the CC, they'll see a, you'll see a like, copyright image uh, symbol at the bottom of the photo. Um, so for those, you'll have, you'd have to get permission, specific, express permission from the, from the photographer. Thank you. The next question comes from S. Davies. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I'd like to make a comment on the, the uh, legislation that is, that, that is pending. Uh, we just uh, heard recently in the, from the Ontario government about the limiting the role of the conservation authorities and in terms of, of land use and um, development applications. And I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are on what the link is between um, the limited, more limited role of conservation authorities in areas that are particularly in the watershed areas and where there are urban natural areas where you do have a, a large, in, a, a larger incidence, I would think, of natural uh, sightings and possibly a, a really important relationship between the conservation authority and iNaturalists and the other Parks Canada and others. But I'd just like to ask you what your views are of this pending legislation and um, what the impact might be. Um, I honestly haven't been following the what those specific changes would be. Um, I mean, as far as the the interface between iNaturalist data goes and conservation authorities and, and other organizations that the, the the information is and or can be and is used for um, making certain decisions with respect to conservation. Um, so I, like I know the city of Ottawa for one is using that for um, 
with respect to urban planning or development applications and, and other um, entities are using it for like screening a site maybe before development. Um, Parks Canada incorporates that into their way they um, manage uh, the conservation values of, of the park. So um, the data is freely available for those kinds of organizations to use. Um, with respect to the, you know, the, the decrease in um, uh, capabilities or powers of the conservation authorities, I, you know, I, I don't know exactly the, what that kind of impact that's going to have. I mean, anytime there is a step backwards or away from uh, what we see as an end goal for conservation is concerning, and I guess we'll have to, we'll have to see how that plays out. Thank you. The next question comes from Lynn Nguyen. Hi there. I have a comment uh, for someone who asked about restoring old slides uh, of uh, pictures of wildlife that she took uh, long ago. There are services in Ottawa that offer this. Uh, one of them is Suters, S-O-O-T-E-R-S. Um, and they do restoration for film and slides um, and turn them to digital files in case uh, she's interested. That's great. Thank you for that. The next question comes from EOD at ncf.ca. Yes, hi. I have an actual addition to the, to the question related to how to digitize old slides and old photos. Talk to the Ottawa Public Library. They have all kinds of equipment there. You can convert old VHS to DVD and all the rest of it. So, uh, although I don't have any slides myself, I'm pretty sure they have a pretty they have a good idea or some equipment you can use just by virtue of being an Ottawa Public Library member to change your your old photographs into uh, digital products. That's wonderful. Thank you very yeah. much for that tip. It's amazing yeah, both that you those can get are good. done at the library. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep both those in mind for future for the future talks because I, I, I'm sure I'll get that question coming up again. Well, it looks like we've run out of questions for the moment. I'm not seeing any more hands. Um, and it is 10 after 8. So I, I think, James, we, uh, we need to just sort of thank you again for your excellent presentation. I, I thank all of you online for joining us this evening. Uh, these are, you know, different times now, but it's great that we were able to still get together and carry on the Wildlife Speaker Series in this different but uh, equally accessible format. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of nice not having to go out into any kind of weather to go see a presentation in the evening. Um, you know, although tonight certainly wasn't a bad evening to be out. So, uh, James, you can expect to receive a small token of our appreciation in the mail. We did send it to your office location, so I hope periodically you are going in to check on that. Um, and for all of you folks online, we will be continuing the series next year, uh, whether it's digital or, or not, I'm not sure. At this point, we will continue to be guided by public health, of course. Um, but certainly having the online option for people seems to be very popular. And so I think we'll try to keep that going. For those who are interested in local planning matters, uh, you may want to tune in to the city's Engage Ottawa website tomorrow. I believe we're going to be unveiling the draft official plan. So that's a bit of an exciting moment for those who are into, uh, you know, planning for, this, for the future of this city. And certainly, you know, my team's been involved in that in trying to make sure that our natural areas continue to be protected, available, and that we have lots of available, accessible green space for people to get out and do their nature observing in. Uh, certainly, I think our takeaway from this year has been that people really do value being able to get out into green spaces, natural areas, parks, and we, uh, we really do need to make sure that everybody has that option to get out there and enjoy those spaces safely outdoors. So thank you all very much for joining us this evening. James, 
thank you again. And I hope to see you all again in the spring. Uh, topic yet to be determined. Thank you. Thank you as well, everyone. And thanks, Amy and the City of Ottawa for uh, engaging with me and uh, giving me the opportunity. This, this is good. <laughs>